title of my message today is Semper Fidelis. Semper Fidelis. The United States Marine Corps considers itself special. It was announced last week that the four-star general, General Kelly, who is Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, is resigning his post and retiring. And though it is assiduously denied, folk who watch these things say that recent events have deeply affected this military leader, the Marines. I studied a bit of history concerning the Marines, and the first nation ever to have a unit called Marines was, of course, Greece in 500 B.C., and they defined the Marines as sea soldiers or naval infantry. They are not Navy because they don't just fight on the sea. They are not quite Army because they usually train with the Navy and arrive by sea vessels. So Greece organized the first units called Marines 500 years before Christ was born. They are generally regarded as assault landing forces. Indeed, the emblem used by the United States Marine Corps is an eagle sitting on a globe with an anchor slicing through it. They love to tell you that they are an elite group. They advertise, we don't want just everybody, only a few good men. As you read the history of our nation, you will learn that entrenched enemies around the world have withered before wave after wave of leatherneck fighting men. In 1775, the United States organized its Marine Corps. One year later, they declared their independence from Britain, and the Leathernecks landed in the Bahamas early during the Revolutionary War. They advertise and train with the idea that they are ready for instant expeditionary service. I hope this isn't boring to you, that you'll put some little pins in some of these because we're coming back to them. They say they are the first to fight our battles for us. And they have fought in every war since 1775, making more than 300 landings in foreign territory. They say, we have been tried by fire. Their marching song says, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, we will fight our country's battles on land and on the sea. They raided the halls of Montezuma in Mexico City in the year 1847. And indeed, they have fought their way around the world. They are known for what they call spit and polish. They are the elite group. Their uniforms are aesthetically beautiful. They are designed to inspire pride. And many young men have joined just to wear the uniform. They are known for their toughness. And for a long time, they wore leather scarves around their necks to indicate that they were not ordinary soldiers. And they got the nickname Leatherneck. Their official colors are scarlet and gold. Scarlet to represent blood and sacrifice. We will die for our cause. And gold to represent faith and love 
and loyalty. They have spilled their blood against overwhelming odds. They were the first to hit the beaches of a thousand islands during World War II. They bored into the steaming, infested jungles where furious enemies were already dug in and yet trembled as they saw the Marines coming. Walter Cronkite said they took many of those places inch by inch. I read something about their attitude. It said that the Marines expect to win. They don't ever expect to lose. No matter how many fall, no matter how large the task, they expect to win. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most famous photographs ever made was of the flag raising on Mount Suribachi in Iwo Jima. And down near Arlington Cemetery, there is a huge statue of that flag raising. And I have stood there, and I have looked at it, and the chill bumps have come on my skin. 1967, my sister's boy was on the front line in Vietnam, a member of the United States Marines. He'd been brought up in the church, but he gave it up. Now in a place of danger, his letters to his mother spoke of a longing to get it right with God. And I had a ticket in my pocket to Saigon. The Red Cross was going to bring him in from the front so that I could talk with him about his soul. And while I was en route... I was intercepted by a telegram. Three communist bullets had tore into his skull, ripping the top of his head off. And my sister's son's name is on panel 13E, Vietnam Memorial, within the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial. In 1868, they adopted their emblem, and that same year adopted their motto, Semper Fidelis. I want you to say that with me. Semper Fidelis. Say it again now. It means always faithful. Always faithful. John Philip Sousa wrote a hymn for the Marine Corps. The title of it is Always Faithful. Because they are the elite corps, from their ranks exclusively, the United States government chose the guards who would look after American embassies and property in the various countries around the world. They said these men will be always faithful. Besides, they were representative of the character and the strength and the determination of America in their red, white, and blue uniforms. And even though they were just human beings with ordinary weaknesses, these men generally prevailed and went beyond their limits. And it could be said of them, they were always faithful. But in recent months and years, tragedy after tragedy has struck. I think of that explosion of bombs in Lebanon. 258 Marines died. And in spite of that, every other Marine in the Corps wanted to go and settle the score. But instead, they were ordered to retreat. And this hurt them, for Marines don't retreat. Very recently, of all people, very recently, of all people, United States Marine Guards have been arrested who guarded the Moscow Embassy. 
What happened to them? Did someone put a gun in the face? Did someone put a knife in the back? No! Women did it. Women did it. Women conquered them without a fight, using only their voluptuous charms. These men who could stand anything and declare we will be always faithful could not resist the burning call of the flesh. And ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you that a crisis, a crisis unprecedented in United States history has been perpetrated by these men. And you with me would wonder, certainly not the Marine Corps, they say we build men. And I will pause to tell you men folk now, a man is not a man just because he wears pants. A man is a man who can stand up and say no to temptation. A man is a man who can be true to his own wife. In a very special sense, the national honor of the United States has been tied to the Marine Corps. For these men represented and spoke for the United States of America all around the world. And if people in other countries get the impression that our Marines are spineless and without character, they will think of our country as being that way. Now the interesting thing is, the FBI had warned them carefully. I want you to get this expression now. I found it in Newsweek magazine. The FBI said to these men who guard our embassies, Be careful, for the KGB, the secret service of the Soviet Union, the KGB will use honey traps. What did I say? I want you to remember that. They're not coming with atomic and nuclear weapons. They're coming with honey traps. you got to be careful. Representative Charles Wilson of the House Intelligence Committee said that Russia throws beautiful women at young, lonely Marines. He would like to make an excuse for them, but their motto precludes any excuse. They said we will be always faithful. Women or no women, we'll be faithful. The CIA is red-faced, for they have learned that KGB forces were free to prowl our embassy and photograph at will. These gods had vowed simple fidelis. Now they compromised their own honor and repudiated their own motto. When the Secretary of State went to have talks in Russia, he had to meet at a motorhome. And they called it sarcastically the Winnebago Summit. A report came back to the American people. In order to re-sanitize our embassy, get rid of all the bugs, it would cost more than 50 millions of dollars in Russia alone. And there are 262 embassies around the world, and most of them are infected. They found out in this inquiry that the one in Vienna is, and the Marine Guard there has been arrested. His problem, a woman. Are you listening? Men who stood the test of fire and blood and smoke at Guadalcanal, the Marshall Islands, Iwo, Dream, Iwo Jima, Truk, Palau, Korea, and Vietnam, now it is assumed cannot be trusted. And even the faithful men are bearing this reproach. They had measured up for scores of years. They had given the last full measure of devotion. Now, for the most dangerous period possibly in the history of the United States, Marines are being taken easily by women. I say with other Marines, shame, shame. 
at the Quantico Marine Base in Virginia, Marines are being polygraphed. U.S. News and Wells Report said all veterans who are now gray-haired, some of them with missing legs and arms, are grieving. Did you hear me? There was pride of family and country. They were a unit bound together by a common motto. And these men are grieving now. They are grieving now. For they had always felt that under any circumstances, the Marines would be always faithful. One cynical writer has suggested maybe they ought now to adjust the motto. Maybe it ought to read... Always faithful until. Maybe it ought to read, Always faithful unless. Maybe it ought to read, Always faithful as long as it's easy. Men who were unstopped by vermin and snakes and leeches and hailstorms of bombs and napalm, men who withstood the thunder of howitzers, the laughter of machine guns, and the barking of carbines, in these last days are breaking down. Their strength and resolve dissipated. Their motto without meaning. They are not always faithful. This is not a military sermon. There are tragic parallels in Scripture and in prophecy. God had led the Jews out of Egypt with the intention of carrying them straight into the promised land. But because of murmuring and complaining and doubting and blasphemy, they wandered around in a wilderness until that wilderness became a colossal graveyard. And now God is ready to move into the promised land. The Bible says they came at last to a place called Beth Peor. Beth Peor. The word Beth means house of. Peor means gate. God brought them to the house of the opening gate. From where they were, they could look across Jordan and see the promised land. Church, they were almost home. If you're with me, say amen. amen. It seems to me that if nothing else excited them, it should have excited them to look over into the promised land and see the land flowing with milk and honey. They are almost home. What can stop now, would you like to know? The Bible says women. And in Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White says, what the enemy could not do with their swords, they did with their harlots. Here were men and women and children who had been in a wilderness, you'd think they'd get tired of the wilderness. They're almost home. The enemy comes with women. And as a result, a plague came amongst them, and thousands fell because of the wrath of God. They had gotten mixed up with the heathen, with heathen customs, with heathen idols, with heathen ornaments. With heathen garments, with heathen flesh. Men tested by fire, but could not resist the burning of the flesh. And they failed. They failed within sight of the promised land. And I want to tell you something. It was not persecution that made them fail. It was not a spear at the heart that made them fail. It was not a knife drawn at the throat that made them fail. They had been without match in war. And what they couldn't do, God did for them. 
Not only that, but we are told in the spirit of prophecy, they understood God's instructions very well. God had already told them how to behave, and they had already found Semper Fidelis. They said all that the Lord have spoken, we will do. And when they said that, they were saying what the Marines said, always faithful Lord. I want to pause to tell you right now, every time a preacher preaches the straight message and you say amen, you are taking a vow. For that's what amen means. It means I understand you, Lord. I will not argue with you, Lord. I'm willing to obey you, Lord. I will be true, Lord. If you don't mean that, you ought not say amen. Now, these Jews failed and died. They had the word of God. They had the spirit of prophecy. Uh, I'm going to say that one more time. They had the word of God and they had the spirit of prophecy. The writings of Moses were right there in the side of the ark. But just like now there were smart elects, not amongst the heathen, but in Israel, who were spreading the rumor you couldn't trust the spirit of prophecy anymore. If they had listened to the spirit of prophecy, they would have been faithful at best PR. That's history. Now, prophecy. John said, I saw a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand. And I got to interject something here. John said, I looked down the stream of time beyond the break of eternity. And I saw the Lamb of God standing on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand who had said and meant Sempa Fidelis. I've had them say to me, Mr. President, that seems like an awful small number. I don't know what it means, if anybody does tell me. But I'll tell you what I heard my old homiletics teacher said. He said, you can talk about it being a small number all you please. He said, what's bothering me is, I wonder where God's going to get that many. Spirit of prophecy says, not one in 20 is ready. Come on, say amen out there. But I like something John said about him. He said they were without fault. In their mouths, no guile. But there's this little interesting point that he makes. He says they were undefiled with women. Don't get quiet on me. Undefiled with women. Women took our Marines in Moscow and Vienna. Women took the children of Israel at Beth Peor. And John says, those who ultimately triumph will be those that the women with their charms and their charisma could not touch. Women whose music and ecstasies could not lure away from the commandments of God. I don't need to tell you that when prophecy speaks of a woman, it's referring to the church. And in Revelation 17, John said, I saw a great whore, and she is the mother of harlots or other whores. John is talking about spiritual churches. That delude and draw away men's minds from loyalty to God and from His commandments, would you say amen? Amen. With their music, with their charismatic sessions and subjective experiences, with their ecstasies. I'm going to mention this one again. 
with their music and its voluptuous beat because people feel good. Every one of those Marines would tell you it felt good. Every Jew at Beth Peor will tell you it felt good, but it brought dishonor. These are not defiled with women. When I was in Brazil, I saw a film made by the church down there called The Final Victory, based on the seven last chapters of the book Great Controversy. The whole film was done in Portuguese, but I didn't need any interpreter, and if you were familiar with those chapters in Great Controversy, you wouldn't have needed an interpreter either. I understood it clearly, but in that portrayal on the screen, I saw friends in the Adventist church turn against friends in the Adventist church, children turned against their parents and betrayed them. Mothers turned against their children and betrayed them. That film had such impact on me that I stood to watch it five times and couldn't understand a word I heard. But I was dealing with prophecy. There's a question which John wrote. As he saw it all culminating, he said, Who shall be able to stand? Who's going to make it? With deception thickening around God's people like a cloud. When it's hard to tell what's right and what's wrong. When wrong sounds good and right is revolting. Who's going to make it? Who shall be able to stay. As I was jotting down my notes, the first thing that came to my mind was a text found in Hebrews 12. It says, looking diligently. God had already said to the church, watch. Watch what? Watch yourself. Watch the word. Watch fulfilling prophecy. Watch. And now St. Paul says, Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. The margin says, lest you fall from God. you got to watch yourself, church. My brothers and sisters, with a compassionate heart, I tell you, you got to watch, lest you fall from God. Then it says, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. A root of bitterness. In my yard, I have trouble with dandelions. Dandelions have tap roots. I read about them. A little old dandelion flower can have a root that goes down 24 inches. You can go out there and pull them all you want to. All you do is pitch them off, and that root will send up another one just as soon as you turn your back. It occurred to me that dandelions are hypocrites. You know why I say that? Because they will give you the prettiest little yellow flower you ever saw. And while you are fascinated with the flower, that thing is spoiling your yard and your garden. And as soon as it gets a little dry, and as soon as the first wind blows, it will scatter its seed of trouble and destruction all over the place. Little hypocrites will start to grow. In the choir. In the Sabbath school. On the church board. Even the conference committee. Hard to get rid of. God said, watch bitterness. Lest some root of bitterness spring up in you, trouble you, 
cause you to lose your hold on God. Today as never before, God's remnant church is under attack. And the amazing thing is, you hear more trouble coming from within the church than from without. But I want to tell you right now, we already have the assurance of prophecy that this church will not fail. Would you say amen? When I was a boy, my father used to harvest white potatoes. And in our yard, under a shade tree, there'd be a whole mountain of white potatoes standing eight or ten feet high. And after we'd gotten them all in, we got stools and we sat around the edge. And we had to go through a culling process. All of the good ones were gathered into the garner. All of those that were cut and hurt and spoiled and rotten had to be put aside. Well, God is now about to call His church. Would you say amen out there? There are some who are bruised and won't get over it. There are some who have been cut by some sharp tongues. And they are going to give up. And there are some that are plain rotten. They are still in the pile. But God is going to separate them. He's going to call His church. And the thing that we saw in that film is going to take place right here in America. I wonder how many of you have felt hurt when you see the culling going on. I know there are mothers sitting here right now who get hurt when their children back away from the truth. I sat out there and listened to those children up here, and I thought to myself, Oh God, if we could just save them. If we could just keep them singing sweetly. If we could do that, we'd hardly need to do evangelism. But as soon as they get old enough to start making their own decisions, too many will turn away from Christ and truth and walk in the paths of unrighteousness. And mothers and fathers and pastors and friends are hurt now. Yes, God's let me baptize a lot of people. And I don't know of anything that hurts me worse than to see somebody God let me baptize all painted up and bejeweled and trying to look like a swinger when they look like a dunce. It hurts. I'm beginning to understand what God meant when he said he's got to have somebody in Zion sighing and crying because of abominations done in the church. Criticizing. Tearing down the standards. Belittling the foundations. Hurt. Hurt. You think it hurts us? What do you think it's doing to Jesus? He's the one who paid the price. And the Bible says when we back away from the truth, we crucify the Son of God afresh and put Him to open shame. Think of the insensitivity of Thomas, an unbeliever. He said, unless I put my finger in the holes and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now that is a man without feeling. Christ had risen. The wounds were healing. But he's willing to tear them open again. He's willing to rip open his side again. Just because he had trouble believing the word of God. I have a friend from South America. He told me this story. He told us. There was a worker for the cause in Brazil. That worker got upset because he wasn't making as much money as he thought he should. Finally, he hired a lawyer and sued the church. Then he lost the case. Next, he lost his job. Then he lost his friends. After that, he lost hope. 
put a gun to his head and blew his own brains out. Disaffected. The root of bitterness springing up. Church Ellen White says, we have more to fear from within than without. In Great Controversy, page 608, she said, Men of talent who once rejoiced with us will become our most bitter enemies. A group of our church members, did you hear what I said? A group of our church members met in Monterey, California. In a convention, their purpose was to celebrate their new freedom in Christ. Well, what was that all about? They said we are now free from obeying the law, free from the standards and rules, free. All we got to do is love Jesus. And when they announced they were leaving the church, the auditorium burst into applause. Ladies and gentlemen, it is happening now. Reminds me of a prophecy that says a certain group will perish. And then the Bible says the reason they're going to perish is because they wouldn't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie instead of the truth that they all might be damned. It's happening now. I asked my friend for the China report. The China report is about the men and women of our church in China during the revolution by Mao Zedong. They turned against each other and betrayed their own brothers and sisters, and some of them lost their lives. That's the prophecy. It's going to happen again. I will tell you, church, the world is now turning vicious. There is what we call a Rambo complex. Macho men bent on death and destruction. They play games with machine guns. The devil now is destroying in them a love for the sacredness of human life. And when the time comes for this country to pass a law that commandment keepers should die, they will be ready to vote. That's where we are. The Bible says the world hates you. Some of us are so anxious to be friends with the world, we just suck after the world all the time. The Lord says the world hates you. That's the best reason why we ought to love one another. Would you say amen? We got enough folk hating us now without us hating one another. Simple fidelis. It's required that we be faithful. But it takes more than a song. It takes more than a testimony. It takes more than a motto. Jesus said of these they honor me with their lips. Please turn that away from me. They honor me with their lips. Draw near to me with their mouths. But their hearts are far away. You might ask, Lord, how faithful do you want me to be? Why, Lord, I'm ready to die for you right now. God answers, I'm not asking you to die. I'm asking you to live for me. But, Lord... I want to prove how faithful I am. I'm ready to give my body to be burned. God says before you start burning your body, why don't you pull off your jewels? Why don't you wash that stuff off your face? But Lord, why you bother us with those little things? Well, haven't you read where I said in Luke 16, 10, that if you're faithful in that which is least, you'll be faithful in that which is much? 
before you're ready to die and do something big, you got to do something little. Well, Lord, how faithful do you want me to be? Lord says, let me give you an illustration. How faithful do you want your wife to be? How faithful do you want your husband to be? Now, I'll tell you something right now. I want my wife to be so faithful that nobody ever misunderstands. I don't want anybody even mistaking an expression on her face. I shouldn't tell you this. When I was in high school, there was a teacher who had a nervous problem, and her right eye winked all the time like that. One day she told an old hard-headed boy to report to her after school for punishment. And he didn't show up. Next morning she sent word for him to meet her in the principal's office. And when they were face to face, she said, Didn't I tell you to come to me after school? Yes, ma'am. Did you understand me? Yes, ma'am. Why didn't you come? He said, well, I was going to do it, but you winked your eye. How faithful do you want your husband to be? God said, read Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as your own flesh. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And while this is beautiful and intimate and seems so social, Paul said in verse 31, this is a mystery. But I'm not talking about husband and wife. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Would you say amen? How faithful, Lord, as faithful as a good wife to her husband. For I will be as faithful as a bridegroom who loves his wife more than he loves himself. Satan today couldn't ask for more. Satan today must be delighted. He doesn't even have to fight us. He's got us fighting each other. He doesn't have to fight the spirit of prophecy. He's got scholars doing it. Come on, say amen out there. Satan must be amazed at how easy it is. He doesn't even have to waste his firepower. He's got church member criticizing leadership. Church member writing vitriolic letters to the general conference. Church members accusing the Lord's servant of plagiarism. Church members throwing away the testimonies when they need them more than they ever did in their lives. And he's got us fascinated with women. Yesterday. When did I say? The president of the general conference said to me, CD, we are being plagued by the philosophy of theological pluralism in our church. What is that? That's this notion coming out of high places that all of us can have our own ways to heaven and yet be one in the room of the church. God says that's a lie. One Lord, one faith. One baptism, one way. But Satan stands there with a net. He tells his imps, don't shoot yet. Don't send an arrow. Don't pick up the sword. Let's skim off all the easy ones. Let's take all those who don't even put up a fight. Why don't you use your firepower, Satan? If we do that, we'll make some of these hypocrites start praying. And if they start praying, they might get straightened out. Let's don't use that yet. Let's just take the easy ones. I'm amazed at how easy it is. 
I'm amazed that thousands of people instantly can pull out from the faith and follow an apostate. That amazes me. You know what? Since I've been on television, folk get to know you, recognize you. I could leave the Adventist church tomorrow, and in two weeks' time, there'd be a thousand fools joining the C.D. Brooks Reformed Seventh-day Adventist church. And I would be the biggest fool of all. Done made up my mind. Uh Uh-uh. You can leave if you want, and not me. Spit in my face, I'm going to be right here. Talk about me as much as you please. I'm going to talk about you when I get on my knees. I'm not going anywhere. Simple Fidelis. You all have to pardon me for slowing down. I shouldn't have had that fan on me. Ellen White says that Satan was bothered from the moment God said, I'm going to send the Messiah. In Genesis chapter 3. Soon as Eve had her first baby, the devil was standing there in the delivery place. Put his eye on Cain. But he saw a spirit in Cain that didn't worry him. Gave him the second one, Abel. But he saw something in Abel that worried him. Abel was willing to do what God said. Cain followed his own wisdom. Devil said to Cain, you better kill him. And Cain killed his brother, Abel. Devil thought Abel might be the Messiah. Hundreds of years later, the devil heard God make a covenant with Abraham. Through your seed, the Messiah will come. So he put his eye on Isaac. After that, he watched Esau and Jacob. Esau had the wrong spirit. Jacob had the right spirit. Got him mixed up in fraud. Fled for his life. Wanted to kill him. God showed him a ladder. Extending from earth to heaven. And God said to Jacob, I'm renewing the covenant of Abraham and Isaac with you. When Jacob started home that the covenant might be fulfilled, Ellen White says Satan stirred up Esau to kill Jacob. Only the grace of God spared Jacob. Then his sons proliferated. Hundreds of years later, they had been down in Egypt. Devil was studying the prophecy. He knew the time of deliverance had come. When he saw Moses born in the right home, he began to conspire to put Moses to death. He told Pharaoh... Kill all the newborn boys. But they put Moses in a a little basket, pitched with pa. And Pharaoh's own daughter saved him and raised him as a prince in Egypt. You can't defeat God when his purposes are set. Would you say amen out there? Down the stream of time came the devil. He heard the annunciation to Mary. And he heard the angel tell Anna, Elizabeth that is, that her son would be the forerunner. Tried to destroy John the Baptist. Soon as Jesus was born, he told Herod, kill all the newborn babies. He's trying to cut us off, folk. Trying to destroy the plan of redemption. Ellen White says that plan was laid down too deep. To fail. Would you say amen out there? Oh, thank God the devil can't stop it. Lay down too deep. Christ grew up. Devil met him on the Mount of Temptation, but he couldn't take him. Then he had him arrested. He appealed to Christ's flesh through trouble. The whip laid his skin open like a straight-edge razor. The nails were pounded through his hands. They covered him with spit. And as if that were not revolting enough, 
You should have smelled the mess. Trying to discourage Jesus. Even on the cross, he got all of his demons and all of the men cooperating with him. And they hurled their insults at a dying Savior. When Jesus went into the tomb, the devil set a guard to try to keep him in there. But early Sunday morning, angel came down from heaven. Christ had already risen. Angel rolled a stone away. Jesus came out a conqueror. Bible says he is the cornerstone of the church. Ladies and gentlemen, the true church cannot fail because it's built on Jesus Christ. Let me read you something. Ministry of Healing 176. Listen. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in the life. By yielding up the will to Christ, we ally ourselves with divine power. A victory over appetite and lust is possible to everyone who will unite his weak, wavering human will to the omnipotent, unwavering will of Christ. I asked a challenging question. Who's going to make it? I give you some good news. Everybody here can make it. Worst sinner in this auditorium today can make it. Might have shot dope in your veins this morning, but you can make it. Might have lied to your husband last night, but you can make it. Everyone willing to unite his weak human will to the unwavering will of Christ can make it. And the spirit of prophecy says... Your will then becomes omnipotent. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe this. And because I believe this, I'm going to make a statement this morning that will sound almost arrogant. I am going through. I say to the Lord Jesus, C.D. Brooks stands Semper Fidelis. You say to me, look at you. As weak as you are, how on earth can you make such a statement? I don't make it because I'm strong. I make it because he is. I don't make it because I'm pure. I make it because he is. I don't make it because I know the way. I make it because he does. I don't make it because I'm solid. I make it because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Last Sabbath, in one of the great days of camp meeting, I sat out there and listened to the Word of God that stirred my soul. I looked up here and I read about exceeding great and precious promises. You know, I've had folk make great promises to me and fail. I've had folk made pre- make precious promises to me and didn't keep them. I've had folk that I trusted let me down. So you don't help me telling me that he made great, exceeding great and precious promises. That has happened to me before. But when I add scripture to scripture, the Bible says in Hebrews 2, We have a faithful high priest touched with a feeling of our infirmity, understands our weakness, and he is faithful who made the promise. In Hebrews 23, the Bible says just that. He is faithful that promised. And in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. 
and just and will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So even if I make some mistakes in the future, my motto is still simple for dailies because he is faithful. I have no confidence in myself. My confidence is in Him. And I might as well tell you something now. God never promised the way would always be smooth. He didn't promise there would always be sunshine. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's almost discouraging. The world honors apostates and dishonors apostles. Sinner drives a Cadillac. Christian drives the Volkswagen. You know what I mean, don't you? But there's a word in the Bible I want to call your attention to. That word I have learned to love more and more. That word is recompense. What did I say? God says, I'm keeping a record. Every tear you shed is measured in a bottle. Every time your heart is broken, I got a record of it. And one day I'm going to recompense. What does recompense mean? It means I'm going to pay you back. And God keeps good records and he pays back with manifold interest. Would you say amen? If you lose your family because you want to serve God, he said, I'm going to recompense. When I start gathering my people together and I see some folk who came into heaven by themselves, I'm going to set the solitary in families. That's Psalm 68 and verse 6. Some of you will lose your fortunes because you want to obey God. He said, don't worry about that. When we all get to heaven, I'm going to pave the streets with gold. Gold last week was $4.34 an ounce. God's got so much of it up there, He has paved the streets and the sidewalks. And use some to build your mansion. Recompense. Would you say amen out there? Some of you will lose your health trying to serve God. Recompense. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor sighing. Neither shall there be any more pain. Recompense. Some of you will lose loved ones in the grave. Recompense. Trumpets going to sound. Dead in Christ shall rise first. Recompense. Some of you had to take off your jewelry. Maybe I was stupid, but I told people to take off these wedding rings. And I know women all across this country, some of whom were beaten by their husbands. Do you hear me? Some of them were beaten by their husbands for pulling those rings off. Walk up and put them in my hand. Pastor Brooks, I want you to keep it. I won't even be tempted to put it back on. White women have sent them to me in the mail. Well, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you what to do. It's a personal thing. But I'll tell you this. If you have to give up your jewelry, recompense. God says, I got some angels on duty right now. And all they're doing is making crowns. And they're making them out of solid gold. And when I looked at the crowns, they still look too plain. I said, put some stars in those crowns. Would you say amen? And every one of us is going to have a starry crown. Be thou faithful. Unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. In closing, I want to tell you something maybe you never thought of. When I did all this backgrounding on the Marine Corps, when I read of their willingness to be instant as an expeditionary source, when I read of their courage, when I read that they were invincible, When I read they'd never lost a war, I said to myself, God has a Marine Corps. They work on land and sea. 
And I want to add one more because I was in an airplane not too long ago and the pilot thought we were going to crash. But God's Marines work in the air also. Caught a hold of that airplane. Brought it down to earth safely. God's got these expeditionary forces. That's why he said when you're in trouble, I am a present help. I send my Marines on the wing. Bless God, they're able to take care of the enemy. They will drive the enemy back into his hole. They have encamped round about you, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Last thing I'm going to read. Reviewing Herald, 1897. All. How many? All who will gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their defections, and loyalty from their treason will triumph with the third angel's message. Say amen. amen. Say praise God. praise God. All. When other folk are growing cold, it makes me warm. Because I have read the prophecy. And even they are growing cold as a fulfillment of prophecy. Even they, those who become scoffers are proof that the word of God is the truth. Those who denounce the spirit of prophecy are proof that the spirit of prophecy is true. I gather warmth from their coldness. I gather loyalty from their treason. I am not discouraged. All they are saying to me is, you can count on the remnant church. You can count on the spirit of prophecy. But above all things, you can count on God. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 128. God calls for a spiritual revival and a spiritual reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more abhorrent to the Lord until He will refuse to acknowledge them as His children. Lukewarm, you're going to get worse until God has to give up. And now the last one. In that same volume, page 121, a revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. Church, you can't walk on water. You can't even overcome sin by yourself. You can't change yourself into what you want to be. You can't give up liquor and drugs and sex. You can't do it, but you can pray until revival comes. I don't mean revival on the church. I don't mean revival on the Sabbath school. I don't mean revival on the conference, brethren. I mean revival on you by yourself in your closet. Don't get up till the power comes. Stay there. Stay there. Jesus is anxious to save everybody at this camp meeting. He doesn't want this crowd cut when we all get to heaven. He wants everybody here saved. And ladies and gentlemen, there's no excuse to go to hell. You can make your vow. 36 years ago, I was going with the most lovely girl I'd ever seen in my life. I don't mean just on the outside. I mean on the inside. Thirty-five years ago, I stood before a minister of the gospel. And many of you, but above all, before God. And without hesitation, I said, Lord, Simba Fidelis. Thirty-five years have rolled by. 
I can look back over 35 years and say, thank you, Lord. 35 years of simple fidelis. Now I've gotten old. Hair turned gray. Nobody wants me now anyhow. I believe I can make it now. I've been going this way too long to turn back. I'm going through. Ladies and gentlemen, by the grace of God, I'm going through. No matter what others do. How about you out there? Bow your head. Close your eyes. Let God speak to your heart now. Don't you let the devil tell you you're too bad. When we get to heaven and hear the testimonies of the redeemed, only then will you understand the depths to which Christ went in order to lift lost men and women. He went all the way down to the gutter that he might save from the gutter up. No matter how bad you are today, he's calling for you. You don't have to listen to the devil. Get him off your back now by surrendering to a Savior who will make himself responsible for your salvation. This has been another special American Cassette Ministries presentation featuring C.D. Brooks. International copyright 1987. All rights reserved.